get started, folks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Perlmutter, peer counselor here at Support Connection. I would like to welcome you all to our nationwide webinar, Don't Lose Sight of the Bigger Health Picture, Surviving and Thriving After a Cancer Diagnosis with Dr. Natalie Berger and Chef Marty Wilson. This program is in partnership with New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. That Dr. Berger and Chef Marty are sharing their expertise and any information or questions pertaining to individual concerns should be discussed with your doctors. I would like to introduce Carolyn Patio, Director for the Cancer Center and Rehabilitation Services at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. Carolyn has over 25 years of clinical and leadership experience within the New York Presbyterian Health System. Carolyn has a degree in physical therapy from the University of Connecticut and a master's in business administration from Scranton University. Carolyn assumed a director role at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley in 2015, where she was able to extend her leadership reach to the Cheryl R. Lindenbaum Cancer Center. There she provides oversight for operational, financial, and patient-centered programs for numerous departments. Carolyn is most excited about working closely with her team of nurses, physicians, therapists, and support staff in serving members of the Hudson Valley community and appreciates their continued partnership with Support Connection as part of that service. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for having us here. Um, I just want to uh, introduce and, and tell you a little bit about what we're doing at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Cheryl R. Lindenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, we are offering quality cancer care and close to home right here in Upper Westchester, and we're making screening and treatment more convenient for you and for your family. Um, we have a seamless access to world-class medical experts. Um, I'm sure you realize that with New York Presbyterian, our physicians here in our oncologists are, and also our radiation oncologists and also our imaging radiologists and our breast surgeons are all Columbia University faculty um, as well. So you're able to access wonderful services here at New York Presbyterian um, Hudson Valley, right here in our neighborhood. Uh, we are providing innovative approaches. We are providing um, certainly a treatment for breast cancer. And we also have an all female um, team right now. Um, so with the addition of Dr. Berger, who's our new medical um, breast oncologist, um, our imaging radiologist in, in imaging, um, and our breast surgeons, and Dr. Berger and Dr. Katz in our radiation oncology team also um, are here uh, to offer services. Uh, we have comprehensive services. Uh, we have all the services that are needed right in one place, which is, is a great advantage as well. So I am very pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Natalie Berger. Dr. Berger is an assistant professor of oncology at Columbia University of Vigelos. College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Associate Director of Breast Medical Oncology at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley. Dr. Berger earned her medical degree from St. George's University. She completed her residency in internal medicine at University of Connecticut, go Huskies, and her fellowship in hematology and medical oncology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, before joining us, Dr. Berger was an assistant professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, focusing on breast cancer and gynecological malignancies. So I will turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And Robin, thank you so much for having us tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here to get to talk to all of you um, and be here to discuss this important topic and help answer questions. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about don't lose sight of the bigger healthcare picture, surviving and thriving after a cancer diagnosis. There's a lot of different points that we can talk about tonight, um, but we're going to focus on some key points, um, most of which I could also probably talk about for an hour. So I'll try to be concise and get to the important points. Next slide, please. So our objectives for this evening will be life after a breast cancer diagnosis, um, talking about lifestyle uncertainty with a cancer diagnosis, as well as the importance of cancer screenings. Next slide. 
So there are a lot of different ways to reduce cancer risk. And it's really important um, to try and incorporate all of these things into our lifestyle. And even when we do all of these things, you know, it's still so important to stay on top of screenings because a lot of the time we don't know why a cancer diagnosis happens. But important things that we can all do to reduce our risk of cancer or a secondary cancer is to stay away from all forms of tobacco, to maintain a healthy body weight and normal BMI, to regularly exercise um, for patients who are cancer, um, cancer survivors who are undergoing breast cancer therapies, gynecologic malignancy therapies. It's really important to focus on weight bearing exercises because chemotherapy and a lot of the treatments that we use for breast cancer can actually accelerate bone loss, which is osteoporosis. So it's really important to, you know, do weight bearing exercises, which is um, weights that are less than 10 pounds, um, things like yoga, Zumba, um, bar, anything like that. You want to stay away from things like jogging because that's a lot of impact on the bones and that can actually cause a fracture. It's so important to eat healthy, plenty of fruits and vegetables. Um, Marty's going to give us an incredible presentation to focus on, you know, different things that we can do and prepare to help, you know, antioxidant properties, um, you know, reducing stress and healthy eating, but eating a healthy diet is so, so crucial. It's best not to drink any alcohol. In fact, the American Society of Clinical Oncology recommends no alcohol at all. Um, for a lot of people, that is hard. So it's just really important to make sure that for women, no more than one drink um, a day, no more than three to four times a week. A drink means, um, you know, an ounce and a half of a hard liquor um, or a four ounce glass of wine. It's very important to always protect your skin with sunscreen. Um, even if you're just going out for a short time, you know, always make sure you're using SPF 30 or above on your face and anytime you're gonna be out in the sun on your entire body. Um, it's important to know yourself. It's important to know your family history and your risks. If you have any concerns, it's really important to talk to your primary care doctor about those concerns. And always get regular checkups and cancer screening tests. Even after a diagnosis of cancer, it's so important to stay on top of your cancer screenings. Next slide. I wanted to take this opportunity to also talk about sexual health because so many women are impacted by this after a cancer diagnosis. And up to 70% of breast cancer survivors can experience issues with sexual health. And it's often something that people don't bring up with their healthcare providers. Oftentimes vaginal dryness is one of the first symptoms that people may experience. And there are things to do to help. There are hydrating moisturizers um, that can help increase moisture in the vaginal and vulvar tissues to reduce dryness and keep tissues moist. And those are things like Hyalo GYN, Reverie, Replens, Good Love. There are a lot of different things on the market. Some of these can be purchased just in a regular pharmacy or ordered online. These types of moisturizers should really be used multiple times a week. It's not an as needed thing in order to improve vaginal dryness. So it's important at least two to three times, if not more a week that these hydrating moisturizers are used. There's also soothing natural oils and moisturizers um, that can help and they can soothe itching or burning like cross and key e suppositories, vitamin E, coconut oil. Pelvic physical therapy can also be really helpful and it's important to talk to your doctor if this is right for you. Um, there's also things called vaginal dilators that can be really helpful for patients with GYN malignancies who get radiation to the pelvis um, and even some breast cancer survivors. So that's another thing that you can talk to your doctor about. And it's very important to avoid any products with artificial fragrances, parabens, petroleum, like Vaseline, um, propylene glycol, or glycerin, because these can be very irritating. Next slide. I wanted to take time to talk about uncertainty after a cancer diagnosis, because this is something that everyone is impacted by, some people more than others, but everybody feels it. There's uncertainty when it comes to the treatments that you're receiving. Am I getting the best treatment there is out there? You know, what's the future going to look like for my treatments? Am I going to need more treatment? Um, and that's really important to, you know, acknowledge and remember that um, it can be really scary after you're diagnosed with cancer. And if you ever have concerns, it's important to talk to your doctor, you know, because they can reassure you. We can talk to you about the evidence, you know, to let you know that you're getting the best treatment there is out there. It's important to talk to your doctors about clinical trials or clinical trials right for you um, so that you know that you're getting the best care. Patients always wonder, am I cured? Is this cancer going to come back? And that's something that so many cancer survivors deal with every single day. You know, there are people who are able to continue going on and it's always in the back of their head. There's people who it's on the forefront of their mind every single day. Everybody's different. 
And it's important to think about yourself and who you are and what you need to help you, you know, continue to survive and thrive. Um, because the stress of all of that and wondering about that can impact people's ability on their day to day basis. And what I tell my patients, what's so important is after a cancer diagnosis, cancer is a part of your life, but you can't let it become your life. And it's important to talk to your doctor about your concerns, you know, social workers, um, anybody who can help support you, and of course, your friends and family. Fear of recurrence and life expectancy, of course, is the biggest fear. Um, and the good news is, is that with screening and early detection, most cancers today are curable. But there is always that risk. It's important to know your body, to know how you feel. If something doesn't feel right or something feels different, don't wait until your visit to talk to your doctor. It's okay to call them sooner. It's okay to call for an appointment. If you have a new pain, something that's not going away, or you're just worried, call your doctor, talk to your doctor, and know that we're always here to support you. Employment and career is so important too. From the time of diagnosis through treatments, surgeries, and even after, you know, during your survivorship care, you can be impacted by the side effects of treatments by going through the treatments. And it's important to talk to your team because, you know, we can help guide you through some of the things during treatment, you know, when it comes to disability, if it's needed, you know, how to talk to your employer and your HR de department to make sure that your job is protected as best as can be, what services are there for you, you know, how treatments are going to affect your career. Um, people worry about, you know, am I going to be able to focus because chemo brain, you know, is real and people really do focus, um, can lose focus after their treatments and such. And so it's really important to talk to your team and your care team on how we can best support you, prepare you, and how we can plan ahead um, for your career and employment. Next slide. Emotions after a cancer diagnosis. So Emotions are so different for everybody. I tell all of my patients, you are an individual. You're not, you know, a statistic. You're not a paper. Everyone is so different. And the emotions that everybody feels after a cancer diagnosis are so different. Um, common, you know, emotions that people experience are depression, anxiety, um, distress. And there are so many things out there and so many resources that, resources that we have to help support you. Support groups, right? Support connections. I mean, this is such a game changer for so many people. And I can't tell you how many patients I have will say, well, I don't really think I want a support group. You know, I'm really not a group kind of person. Um, and hopefully everyone on this call is a part of this. And, you know, but you may have felt that at one time too. Um, but support groups are the absolute greatest support system we have because talking to people who are going through what you're going through, there's nothing like it. Even as a doctor, your family, your friends, we all want to be so supportive and give you our all to help support you through this. But there's nothing like talking to other people who are going through what you're going through um, and to have, you know, the expertise of the people leading the groups to help guide you through this journey. There are counselors, there are therapists, there are chaplains in place um, that can be so helpful. Even if you're not religious, you know, the chaplains really are, they're non-denominational, they're there to talk to anybody and they can be so supportive during this journey. Exercise. Exercise is key for mitigating stress. Even if it's just walking, something that simple, doing that every day for as much as your body can tolerate is so important. It can help reduce the stress. It can help, you know, cope with the stress. Um, and it really just improves energy and the way that you feel. Mindfulness is also really important. There are a lot of apps that are out there now. I feel like during COVID, you know, a lot of people started to ask me about it more um, because it was really on the forefront. And this is something that's been around for so long and it's so helpful. Um, and so that's really another thing, you know, from breathing, from thought, meditation, all of these things can really help reduce stress and help with coping with depression or anxiety. Next slide. I also wanted to really emphasize the importance of cancer screenings, because even after a cancer diagnosis, staying on top of cancer screenings is so important. Screening is so important because it's checking the body for cancer before symptoms develop at a time where it's diagnosed at an early stage where it's easier to treat and cure. You know, early detection leads to early treatment and leads to cure. Next slide. When it comes to breast cancer statistics, breast cancer is the leading cause of death in women worldwide. Men can get breast cancer too. And it's so important because, you know, there aren't screening protocols in place for men, but approximately 400 men die each year from breast cancer. So it's important for men to be aware of this too. In the US, breast cancer is the second most common cause of death. In 2021, there were 281,550 new cases of breast cancer um, in the United States and a little over 4,300 deaths, 43,000 deaths. 
the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer in a woman is about 12.4% or one in eight women. This is why screening is so important because one in eight women are going to get diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And when breast cancer is discovered at an early stage, the goal is cure and we are able to cure most people today. The median age of diagnosis of breast cancer is 62. Next slide. It's breast cancer awareness and it's so month and it's so important to talk about screenings and mammograms because mammograms save lives. The recommendations today are to start mammograms at the age of 40. There was a little bit of difference in guidelines, but recently everything, including the U U.S. Preventative Task Force, does recommend starting mammograms at 40. It's important to go annually. I have patients who say, oh, my doctor said I don't have to because my last one was normal. And the guidelines are to go annually. And I tell my patients, um, you know, even after a mammogram, you know, within the year, a breast cancer can develop. So waiting two years can really miss, you know, the window of diagnosing it early. For women with a family history of breast cancer, it's important to start your annual mammograms no later than 10 years before the age of earliest onset of breast cancer. So patients who have a known BRCA mutation, there's other mutations to PALB2, check 2 If somebody in your family has this diagnosis, or if you do, and you have children or cousins or nieces, nephews, it's important to talk about this history with your family because it can really impact when they would start their cancer screenings. And it can also impact if they want to get tested themselves. So it's really important, like I said before, to know your history, to know your risks, and also talk to your family about those risks, especially if you have a known genetic mutation. Next slide. Another important screening that's extremely underutilized is lung cancer screening. So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, and there's approximately 230,000 new cases a year. And 132,000 people died in 2021 from lung cancer. The leading cause of lung cancer is cigarette smoking. Next slide. Lung cancer screening has recently been expanded and it is available to more people now. The age of screening was lowered from 55 to 50 years old and is recommended through age 80. The number of pack years required to qualify for screening used to be 30, but it was decreased to 20 pack years. And the way to calculate how many pack years you have, it's the number of packs of cigarettes per day multiplied by the number of years that someone smoked. So if someone smoked two packs a day for 10 years, that's a 20 pack year history of smoking. For somebody who smoked one pack a day um, for 20 years, that's a 20 year pack, um, pack year history of smoking. And if somebody is a current or former smoker, so even if you quit within the last 15 years, you would still qualify for lung cancer screenings. And of course, we want to make sure that patients who are doing this in are in good health and could undergo the treatments that would be required, such as surgery or chemotherapy. Um, screening is usually performed using a low-dose CAT scan annually, so it's a low dose of radiation. Um, unfortunately, it is underutilized, and we're figuring out ways to improve screenings. But if this sounds like something you would qualify, it is important to talk to your primary care doctor about. Next slide. So colorectal cancer statistics. So this is the fourth most common cause of cancer in the U.S. Um, there's 100, approximately 150,000 new cases in 2021 and 53,000 deaths. Next slide. So the age of colon cancer screening was reduced to 45. Now there's screening guidelines that say 50 again. Um, and so it's important to talk to your primary care doctor about what's right for you. Um, the age to stop doing colonoscopies is also variable. Um, some guidelines say up to 75, some say up to 85. It really depends on your overall health. And we typically say if somebody has a life expectancy of more than 10 years, then we should really be continuing these screenings. Um, because if we don't and a cancer is diagnosed at a later stage, it requires more treatments, more aggressive treatments, and it could even... Um, you know, not be detected early enough to cure. And so it's important to talk to your primary care doctor about what's right for you. There are different screening options available. There are stool-based tests now, such as Cologuard, where you provide a sample and that sample is tested in a lab for DNA um, that could be consistent with cancer. And if that test comes back positive, then somebody would go for a colonoscopy. And then of course, the standard exam that we've done um, and continue to do is a visual exam using a colonoscopy. The frequency of screening also depends on a lot of factors. Typically, we say if something's normal, people will come back in 10 years. Sometimes doctors will say come back in five years. If there are concerning polyps, then your doctor may ask you to come back sooner, even as early as one year. And somebody's genetic history, some of which are linked with breast cancer or gynecologic malignancies, may also require more frequent colon cancer screenings. So it's so important not to put these off. Next slide. 
Another important screening is cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is rare compared to other cancers in the U.S. It's the fourth, fourth most common cause of female cancers worldwide, and it is more common worldwide than in the United States because of screenings. There's approximately 14,500 new cases in the U.S. in 2021 and 4,200 deaths. The most common cause of cervical cancer is HPV, which can be detected at the time of pap smear if it's checked. Next slide. Cervical cancer screening should start at age 25. And screening is done using the pap smear and also HPV testing, which should be done every five years between the ages of 25 to 65. The frequency of screening does change frequently, and it really depends on what your prior result was and if you had a positive pap smear in the past. Over the age of 65, if testing has been normal over 10 years, then the recommendation is that screening can stop. But if you are 65 and you did have an abnormal pap smear in the last 10 years, then screenings should continue. And the screening should continue even after HPV vaccination, which we have now, which is incredible and is reducing cervical cancer incidents worldwide. Um, but it doesn't cover every single strain of HPV that there is out there. So it's so important to still continue with cervical cancer screenings with a pap smear. Next slide. Skin cancer screening. So it's so important, like I said before, always, always wear SPF. Um, I tell people every year, even if you don't have too many moles, if you're not worried about anything, just do an annual skin check with your dermatologist because moles can hide in weird places, places you may not be able to see on your back, you know, in skin folds, even under the fingernail, it can happen. And so it's really important to see your dermatologist once a year just to do a skin check and make sure everything's okay. Next slide. So in summary, um, like I said before, it's so important to remember that cancer is a part of your life, but you cannot let it become your life. Living with uncertainty is a normal process, and it's important if you're having concerns, if you're having anything that you want to talk to, bring it up to your care team um, because we do have supports in place to help. A healthy lifestyle and exercise are so important to maintain always. Cancer screenings save lives, and screenings can detect cancer early when it's easier to treat and cure. Don't skip a year of your screenings and um, see your primary care doctor annually and ask which screenings are right for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, one woman would like to know what kind of blood work should her primary care physician be doing each year to detect cancer? So there's no blood work specifically to detect cancer, um, you know, and typically it depends on the type of cancer. If your oncologist um, is checking tumor markers and breast cancer, we don't typically do it in early stages. Some gynecologic malignancies are a little bit different. In terms of cancer screenings, you know, there's no specific blood test. It's important every year, you know, your primary care doctor at least once a year should be checking what's called a CBC to make sure your white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets are normal. A CMP, which is a comprehensive metabolic panel, so to check your liver, your kidneys, your electrolytes. It's important to get your lipids, your cholesterol checked every year. Some primary care doctors may check your thyroid. Um, and then the primary care doctor will direct any additional blood work, you know, based on, you know, your past medical history, other things that you may have. Patients who have diabetes will have their hemoglobin A1C checked. I tell patients also once a year to keep an eye on their vitamin D um, because vitamin D is really important for your bone health. And if your vitamin D levels are low, we want to make sure that we're replenishing those because especially for our breast cancer survivors and our GYN survivors, we want to make Make sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure you know strong healthy bones thank you a couple more questions um how important um dr berger is it for nieces um like brothers kids to get checked if your breast cancer was not genetic but you were diagnosed say around the age of 36. so the thing is is that a lot of you know hereditary conditions that can cause breast cancer may not be identified yet. And 36 is a very young age to be diagnosed with breast cancer. So it is important for family members to tell their doctors, you know, typically if there isn't a genetic mutation identified, they'll recommend screenings, you know, with self breast exams, making sure that they're familiar um, with how to do a self breast exam, um, seeing their GYNs once a year for a breast exam. And if they ever feel, you know, anything abnormal, then they should notify their doctor right away, you know, and if somebody says, well, you're not 40 yet, I don't think, you know, you're too young. But if they feel something that's abnormal, they should advocate for that for that test, for that mammogram and ultrasound. Okay. Next question is: um, If you've ha if someone's had genetic testing ten years ago, are there new genes to test for? 
So the genes and what we have checked for have expanded. Um, 10 years ago, probably everything that we have right now are what we tested for back then. Um, but it is important if you did have a panel do, uh, done a while ago, 15, 20 years ago, to talk to your breast cancer specialist um, or a genetic counselor if there are additional tests that you, know, you should be checked for. Um, but they can look over the panel that was done for you to see if there's anything additional that should have been checked for. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, well, Dr. Berger, thank you so much for your passion, dedication, and commitment to the cancer community and to the Hudson Valley community. Um, Marty Wolfson, up next, she's the chef and culinary nutrition coordinator at the Chef Peter X. Kelly Teaching Kitchen at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital is your neighborhood hospital serving the heart of the Hudson Valley community with specialties in cardiology, cancer care, orthopedics, digestive health, obstetrics, and gynecology. Marty is a certified health supportive chef and nutrition educator of over 15 years. She specializes in food therapy, functional nutrition, and mindfulness practice for preventing and healing chronic illness. She has taught food as medicine for those healing from chronic illness, as well as universities, nutrition conferences, culinary schools, advanced nutrition certifications, corporate wellness programs, and health retreats. Marty has a master's in nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States. She's been newly inducted into the prestigious Les Dames d'Escoffier, New York, an unparalleled collective of forward thinking and successful female leaders in all sectors of the food, beverage, and hospital hospitality industries. Thank you, Chef Marty. Thank you so much for that introduction, Robin, and that wonderful presentation, Dr. Berger. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, welcome back. If you've been to the Chef Peter X. Kelly Teaching Kitchen, if you haven't, I'll tell you a little bit more about it at the end of the presentation. Um, so it's wonderful to be with all of you. I, uh, Dr. Berger, you, you set me up <laughs> really well, and I didn't see your slides beforehand, but the two slides on uncertainty and helping to manage emotions after diagnosis and through treatment, um, that's what I want to focus on tonight is the stress that can come from, from illness, from dealing with treatment. Uh, when I began my culinary career 15 years ago, I went right into cooking for patients dealing with um, all levels of, of cancer diagnoses and treatment. And what I saw with all of my clients was the uncertainty of diet, what to eat, what not to eat. There's so much noise and confusion. And I think still today, um, because of our culture, because of media, even our healthcare professionals sometimes can give mixed messages. So I did a lot of navigating and um, not necessarily, a. we did talk of course about what would be beneficial, but it was about personalizing it to you. So there is no one size fits all diet, but in talking about the big picture, you can at least start and focus on an anti-inflammatory diet. We know that that's what's most beneficial and that includes like Dr. Berger was saying, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, olive oil. Does this sound like the Mediterranean <laughs> diet? Um, and then good quality proteins. This could be from our animal proteins or vegetarian proteins like legumes, uh, maybe some good quality tofu or tempeh. So tonight, what I want you to walk away with is you can use foods. You can use foods every day in your diet to help combat and mitigate the stress, you know, we all deal with stress. What we don't want to be in is in a chronic state of stress. So just to review, um, you know, we are evolutionary designed to, to have stressors when we are running from that saber tooth tiger. That's the short acute stress that is good for the body. It can raise the blood sugar, raise um, blood pressure acutely to help us run from that tiger. But when we're in a chronic state and the body, the adrenals in particular, are constantly putting out cortisol, our stress hormone, which does help raise blood pressure and blood sugar to activate. When we're in a chronic state and we have too 
too much cortisol, too much adrenaline in the body, that's when we can go into a pro-inflammatory state and we can have some metabolic dysfunction and inflammation and inflammation can lead to more stress in the body. So you can get into this vicious cycle. But what you put at the end of your fork in your spoon can help. It's part of the picture, not the whole picture, but it's part of the picture of mitigating the stress response. So um, I'm going to do a few recipes tonight that focuses on the nutrients, the anti-inflammatory nutrients that, you know, don't get, don't get too much in your heads about this. I don't want you to get too mental. I want you to just focus on the whole food ingredients I'm, I was talking about because the same anti-inflammatory ingredients are the stress reducing ingredients. Those are your B vitamins, okay? That are so important for metabolizing that cortisol. Okay, um, actually helping to reduce the levels in your body. Omega threes, right? From from fatty, um, some fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, sardines, nuts and seeds too. Avocado, um, magnesium is in everything from pumpkin seeds to almonds to our greens. Magnesium is the calming mineral. Maybe some of you have seen the the calm powder that's out there, that's magnesium citrate that's in there. And then protein. Protein helps to balance our blood sugar, which helps our nervous system stay in a more neutral place. And the last thing is fiber. If you've come to my classes, you probably hear me go on and on and on about fiber <laughs> because we are, we are generally deficient in our Western diet. But there is so much research about the connection between a high fiber diet and lower stress rates, lower anxiety, lower depression. And that is because mostly the, the catalyst in that is that when we have a high fiber diet, we increase something called short chain fatty acids in the colon. And that acts as nutrients for the colon and the, the gut bacteria. And that, gut, that good gut bacteria in turn strengthens our immune system, which lives in our gut, okay? So any, any questions about that? I tried to do a quick 101. Um, one woman is asking if she, is it correct that you should add fiber at dinner? Well, you can just naturally get fiber in dinner by having a good portion of your plate be vegetables, okay. in particular, you know, leafy greens, okay. some of the cruciferous, those really high anti-inflammatory foods um, from the brassica or cruciferous family. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna actually start with, I usually end with sweet, but I'm gonna start with dessert because you can stay anti in, in an anti-inflammatory state and still enjoy some good sweets. So I think it's important when, when you are in treatment or even if you're post, you know, and you're trying to prevent reoccurrence, that if you are gonna have sweets, you make it high fiber. You have some maybe antioxidants in there from berries or a little bit of dark chocolate. And um, you also have some protein to help balance that blood sugar. So we're gonna start with this pumpkin blueberry chocolate muffin that's perfect for the season. And I'm gonna begin with the dry ingredients. So I've got some oat flour, high in fiber, and some almond flour, right? Loaded with magnesium, high in protein, good healthy fats. And then I'm going to add in some cinnamon, which helps stabilize blood sugar. I've got some flax seeds, okay? Really good fats, really good oils in there. Some baking soda. And um, a little bit of salt. Here's my salt. And, you know, I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about, um, this is all prepped out for me, nice and neat, right? <laughs> what, if, what if you are fatigued from, from treatment? What if you just don't have the energy? And my best advice is to have 
a caregiver, have a friend, someone that might bring over a dish, have them make something that's really going to be beneficial for you and delicious. So tell them what you want, not just a pan of lasagna that they might, you know, throw together. And maybe that's what you want, lasagna. <laughs> But maybe you want like a muffin that ju you just want to wake up and have a little healthy muffin or you need that two or three o'clock hour snack. Or maybe you need a little snack to take with you for treatment, okay? Okay, and then the wet ingredients are gonna be two eggs, a cup of canned pumpkin, if you have the recipes with you, you can just follow along. I've got some vanilla extract and almond extract. And then I usually use coconut sugar for the sweet, just because it's a little bit lower glycemic, meaning it won't spike your blood sugar as fast and so much. And then olive oil. I love using olive oil in baking. Great monounsaturated fat. It makes it feel very decadent while still being extremely healthy. And I'm going to mix this up until it's all emulsified. Okay, so we want a really smooth consistency. These come together very, very fast and they freeze well. So you could double it and freeze a batch. Okay, I'm gonna mix this together. And then you can really um, be flexible here with your fruit. So I'm gonna use frozen blueberries, great antioxidants and fiber but you could use uh, dried cranberries, apples, and then um, this is optional, but I like a little dark chocolate, <laughs> which is great magnesium. Dr. Berger, you must get that question all the time. Why do I crave chocolate during my, my, during my period? <laughs> I don't know, is there a connection there you think? I don't know. I don't know, but it does come up <laughs> It does during treatments too. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to mix this and then I like to use an ice cream scooper and I've got my prepared muffin tin. Okay. So I just take this works really well to keep a nice shape and we'll just go right in. And then you could top this with some, some more protein or some more fiber. So um, sometimes I do hemp seeds, which is a great plant protein. I think tonight I'm feeling pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds, um, I often talk about pumpkin seeds as um, the stress, the anti-anxiety seed. It is loaded with magnesium, great for the nervous system. So I'm just gonna sprinkle some toasted ones on there. And then it's like TV, we're gonna pull out the finished one. <laughs> okay, so I did these ahead of time and I put these in a mini muffin pan. Aren't they nice? And it's just the perfect, it's the perfect little snack. Okay, any questions about those, Robin? Actually, we have a question for you and then a um, couple of questions for Dr. Berger. If, uh, do you have a minute? Okay, yeah. so um, one woman would like to know if supplements are as effective as eating everything you're suggesting through foods to get the nutrients and benefits. Is that one for me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Are the okay. supplements as effective? Are supplements as effective? I guess both of you can answer. But. Yeah, I mean, my first, my suggestion is always food first to get it that way. You know, if 
you're really having a balanced plate at every meal and a balanced snack, you're getting the nutrients you need, but it's important to get blood work from your doctor and see if you're deficient um, in any area. Would you agree with that, Dr. Berger? Completely. I always say diet first, you know, it's so important to get your nutrition through your diet. It helps with your digestive health and everything you were talking about in the beginning and the importance of that flora. That's so important for our immune system. And that's what you, where you really get it is from the foods. But sometimes when patients are going through chemotherapy, they may have trouble with getting that balanced diet and getting their nutrition. And then that's when I talk about, you know, supplementation or taking a vitamin or something, you know, where you're not getting it through your diet, but always diet first. Thank you. Um, Dr. Berger, while we have you, um, a woman is asking, is there an age where um, women can stop getting mammograms? So uh, guidelines differ. Um, but what I usually recommend is if we think that somebody has a life expectancy of 10 years or more, then I recommend continuing mammograms. You know, um, cancer is a disease of the aging and, you know, we're seeing sadly more and more young cancers, but still the majority of cancers do happen as we get older. Um, and we see so many women in their eighties, nineties, um, I had somebody who was 103 with breast cancer. And so it can happen at any age. And if we think that somebody's going to live 10 years or more then you should absolutely talk to your doctor about continuing screenings. Okay. And, and on that note of continuing screenings, um, for people with dense breath, um, most of the time they end up with a mammogram and then an ultrasound. Are there technologies that are being worked on to improve upon mammography so that it can be an eliminate the need for the extra um, test of an ultrasound? So, you know, mammogram does has, have its limitations. And the problem is that dense breast tissue can obscure a small mass. And that's where ultrasound um, comes in um, because it can pick something up small that you may not see on the mammogram. Because what mammogram is looking for and what ultrasound is looking for is different. On mammograms, we pick up things like calcifications or a density in the breast tissue. Um, on ultrasound, you know, usually we're picking up, you know, a mass or an area of the breast that may not look normal. And so, Mammogram technology has advanced. Um, there are newer mammogram, you know, machines um, that are better and are better at picking up masses. And so that technology is constantly advancing. Also, artificial intelligence is being used now to help pick things up and improve screenings. And so that technology is constantly advancing, um, but we're not there quite yet where, you know, certain women who do need that ultrasound, you know, won't need it anymore. Thank you. And um, Chef Marty, and actually, Dr. Berger, this might be for both of you to answer. Um, someone is is writing in that they're on an aromatase inhibitor. Have, they have some um, restrictions of their diet regarding animal fat, carbohydrates, and sweets. So um, the, after treatment, they are now underweight. How does somebody get a balance between gaining a healthy weight and dealing with the diet restrictions of the medication? Do you want me to go for that one or do you want to, or both of us? Yeah, I just want to, um, you can take that. I just want to, so people aren't, um, you know, aren't missing anything. I'm just starting the cauliflower soup. So I'm sauteing some leeks in some, just a little bit of butter and olive oil, but you can go ahead to Dr. Burger and take that. Okay. I'm hungry now. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> The important thing is, you know, making sure you're balancing what you're taking in, right? And so you want to focus on the good fats, right? So olive oils, avocados, those things are high in fat, but they're good fats. And they're fats that are going to help you put on the weight, but in the right way. And the important thing about gaining weight is that, you know, you want to do it slowly and by eating the right foods. You want to eat a balanced diet three times a day, and you want to eat healthy snacks in between, right? So nuts are high in calories, but they're high in good things, you know, that are going to help you put on weight. Making smoothies. I tell people, you know, if you're still having a hard time eating, you can throw a bunch of things in a blender and just sip on it. You can add a scoop of protein powder into it. Um, and so those are good ways to help put on weight, you know, um, eating products that are high in good fats, you know, even, you know, dairy products, cheeses, you just want to make sure that you're balancing your diet. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's that's the key point is balancing those macronutrients. It's not just about the fat you might be getting, but getting good quality fat and balancing that with some protein and some carbohydrates. So I'm Robin, I'm just going to talk through this soup a little bit. So I think a soup is a incredible vehicle to get a lot of nutrients into a bowl. 
Um, and again, this is a wonderful thing that you could just sip, you know, if you just aren't that hungry, but you need to sip on something all day is to have broth or soup ready to go in the fridge or freezer. Um, so I love this cauliflower leek soup. It's filled with anti-inflammatory ingredients from leeks, from garlic, and then the main ingredient, cauliflower. So cauliflower is part of the brassica or cruciferous family um, of vegetables. Uh, it has this compound called glucosinolates. This is the main anti-inflammatory chemical okay, that our bodies need, at least a serving of it a day. When I make a creamy soup like this, I take the main ingredient and I've roasted it. So just some olive oil and salt, roasted it until it's a little bit caramelized. And that's gonna sweeten, sweeten it up a little bit. And the sweetness is important, not only to make the, the soup taste great, but also if you're dealing with changing taste buds and you have any metallic taste going on, sweet the sweet flavor is really the key to help balancing the metal, okay? So you may need a little bit of maple or honey on something, but you could also get it naturally by caramelizing a vegetable, okay? So I've got my leeks. They're getting all buttery looking. Leeks are just, I think, the most delicious onion. Um, and then we're gonna add in some garlic. And I like to chop the garlic at least five to 10 minutes before I'm gonna use it. Because when you, and this actually, this actually goes for any sulfuric ingredient, cauliflower, kale, if you, if you disturb it, chop it, smash it, you release these two chemicals in it, called compounds, I'm sorry, aniline and allicin, and they become actually more bioavailable and higher level of antioxidants. So if you can remember, chop your garlic a little bit ahead of time, okay? Kind of a fun fact about the sulfuric ingredients. Okay, this is a very simple soup. We're gonna add in some diced potatoes. This is just a Yukon potato. And this is to give the soup some body without adding cream or dairy, okay? I think potatoes get such a bad rap. I'm a big cheerleader of the potato. Did you know that the potato has some of the highest antioxidants in the vegetable kingdom? And we sometimes swear them out of the diet. <laughs> okay, so I'm salting just a little bit of salt at every layer. And then I've got my vegetable broth. And this is really the key to a real, really nutrient dense soup. So this is homemade broth I do every couple of weeks, huge batch so that I can freeze it and just keep using it throughout the week. It's just onions, carrots, celery, some fresh parsley and thyme, peppercorns and bay leaf. And I simmer that at 45 minutes, for 45 minutes and strain it, okay? So I'm gonna just, Add about a half a cup just to deglaze the pot. And pick up all that yummy stuff on the bottom. And then I'm gonna add about three and a half more cups. And my broth is unseasoned, okay? So I'm gonna season it now. If you need to buy store-bought broth, that's fine. There's some great brands. Just look that it doesn't have any caramel coloring or artificial ingredients, that it's just really whole ingredients. Okay, we're gonna bring this up to a simmer. And while that's simmering away and the potatoes are cooking a little bit more, I'm gonna show you my minty green smoothie. So Dr. Berger just talked about um, smoothies are a great way to get nutrients, good healthy fats. All right, let me just bring my ingredients over. So I always start with the liquid first, okay? And that's so that your ingredients don't get stuck on the bottom. 
I'm gonna begin with some coconut water just to add some natural sweetness. If you wanna uh, just do water, go ahead. If you wanna do a little bit of coconut milk, that would be nice too. Then I've got some pear, okay? Just an organic pear diced up. I've also done a Granny Smith apple. I've done pineapple. We've got some cucumber. Fresh mint leaves, okay? This is just gonna add some wonderful antibacterial, antiviral properties. Then I've got a, a handful of kale, okay? If kale seems like it's gonna turn you away from this, okay, because it's kind of bitter. If you're not used to putting it in your smoothie, just do a little bit more spinach, okay? So I've got my spinach here. And then I've got a lime that I took the rind off. Okay, so that's gonna add a nice sourness. Some ginger, one of the most anti-inflammatory spices. And then we're gonna do some avocado to cream it up. What happened to my knife? Hold on a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna do a half. I'm just gonna take my spoon and scoop it out. I'm gonna add in a little bit of honey. You can leave it out if you'd like. But honey is great prebiotic for the gut, good antiviral properties. I'm gonna put in a little more kale because I love kale. And then for the protein, you could add a scoop of a protein powder that you might like. I'm gonna add a couple tablespoons of hemp seeds. So that's about uh, 15, 10 to 15 grams of protein right there. Okay, and then I'm sorry about the noise if you can hear it. Let me plug that in. One second. Okay, we're plugged in. Do you have time for a question? Sure. Okay. So a woman wants to know if um, if there's a concern about eating too many soy products. Soy? Yeah. Is there okay. a concern about eating too much soy? Yeah, my answer to soy is to make sure you're keeping it to the whole form. So that would be um, GM, GM, non-GMO tofu, some tempeh, edamame, miso, miso paste. I would be careful drinking like cups of soy milk. Um, a lot of our soy, in, in fact, 90% of the soy worldwide is GMO. Um, and I know there's controversy with soy and, and breast cancer, but I think if you keep it to even one serving a day, a whole form, it's actually beneficial. So they're showing many more benefits because of um, the phytoestrogens that are so beneficial. Dr. Berger might have another. Um, no, my answer is actually very similar. You know, um, it's a question that comes up very often for me with patients with um, who have breast cancer. Um, and I say the same thing, you know, soy is in everything. If you look at labels, um, it's hard to find things that say do not contain soy, but they are labeled now um, because people have soy allergies. And I tell people to pay attention to that because, you know, we really want to avoid all genetically modified, you know, foods. Um, and so when it comes to breast cancer, I also say, you know, there are studies that have been done in Korean women um, who have a diet that's much higher in soy, and it actually showed protective benefits um, to estrogen. So the data is really just all over the place right now. We don't know for sure, you know, what the right answer, what the wrong answer is, but I tell people to limit their soy intake, but it's okay to eat um, foods that are natural, you know, like 
um, like Marty said, you know, tofu, things like that. But I say try to, you know, stay away from it every day, um, you know, two to three times a week. Um, but soy is in everything. It's very hard to avoid. So it is important to look at labels to see how much you're getting a day. If someone's dealing with a fatty liver and they need to watch their carbs, right. what's the best way to do both an anti-inflammatory and low carb diet? Um, I think you want to stay away from some of the starchier uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, things like bananas, plantains, sweet potatoes, and go to lower carb butternut, butternut squash, zucchini, summer squash, um, carrots, things like that. Um, and you can find that. You can find a nice list online for, for um, low starch fruits and vegetables. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pretend this has simmered for about um, 10 minutes. I'm going to add in the cauliflower. The cauliflower really doesn't need to be cooked anymore. If you prefer a chunkier soup, you can have it just like this, or you could blend half of it. I'm going to go ahead and blend the whole thing. If you have an immersion blender, that works really well. I'm going to pour it into my Ninja. You could also swap in broccoli, okay, for the, for the cauliflower. Or you could do kale. You could do a whole different cruciferous. So I'm going to add in enough broth. And then the solids. And again, make a big batch of this, freeze it, have it at the ready. And we'll blend. Okay. I don't want to cooperate. Hold on. All done. I don't know why this doesn't want to close. Let me see. Okay, well, we're going to... I'll take some more questions, Robin, while I try to figure this out, <laughs> if I can. Okay. What, what's your feeling Why on- Why TV is so much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This will be the outtake, right? Um, so what, 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 what's your feeling on organic? You know, what's a must organic? I mean, if, do you have to buy your vegetables organic? Do you, A good you know? place to start is the Clean 15 Dirty Dozen. It changes every year. It comes out by the EWG, Environmental Working Group. Um, and it shows that, let's say, cauliflower is low in pesticides. So- you know, if you, it's, it's okay to buy conventional, um, but things like strawberries always show up on the dirty dozen. So, you know, you can really be more discerning looking at a list like that. Uh, berries are highly sprayed. So there's certain things that I just opt for to pay a little bit more in organic or frozen is a really great way to go. You pay less and actually some organic fruits that are frozen contain higher antioxidants because they're flash frozen right away. The nutrients are kept in there. Thank you. Okay, and we're just gonna let you finish up your recipe. Um, What's you, that? We're just gonna let you finish up your-, your, your... <laughs> I know it won't, for some reason oh, my blender working. won't close. But okay. you can imagine it's a creamy, okay. creamy soup. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think that that about wraps it up. Um, and I just want to thank you, Chef Marty, for sharing your wonderful recipes and great information tonight. And Dr. Berger, for you coming on and sharing your wonderful presentation. So much good information here. Lot to think about, lot to digest and enjoy. 
Um, like I said, this is recorded and will be available in a couple of weeks on our website, um, and you will all get notification of that. I want to once again thank you both and the New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital for all that you do for the cancer community and the community at large. Have a great night, everyone, and thanks for coming out. Thanks, Robin. Thanks Bye -bye. for having us. Thank you so much.